you the First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ in St. Albans, Vermont. My name is the Reverend Jessica Moore, and I'm joined this morning by our pianist, Stefan Conradi, and our music director, Aaron Granger. And I also want to say hello and a thank you to Lane McElroy for being our videographer this morning. Here at First Congregational, we are a welcoming group of believers, seekers, and doubters. And please know that no matter where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here to travel with us. We have suspended in-person worship for the time being, but our office is still open Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 11. This morning, I want to let you know about a United Church of Christ-wide special fundraising opportunity for us all. One great hour of sharing. It's our mission work here in the UCC, and we support mission work internationally and domestically, so I hope you will consider making a contribution. You can do so at ucc.org directly. Oh, one other announcement. We have a special Easter memorial fundraising for Spectrum Youth and Family Services who have recently opened a drop-in center here in St. Alban for teens and young adults. Um, it will be in lieu of how we used to raise money doing Easter lilies. So instead of Easter lilies, we'll be giving the money directly to Spectrum and welcome them to St. Albans. Please join me for this morning's prayer. Beloved in Christ, why have you come to worship this morning? We come, we come to, to celebrate the love of God in the form of Jesus Christ. This love reaches through the shadows of our lives to embrace us. Our challenge is to trust the light of God's love in the midst of our struggles. We come, we come to celebrate, to celebrate the light of God, God in Jesus, Jesus who, who offers love and acceptance, not, not judgment and rejection. If only we will trust. Jesus leads us on the way of light and love. We come, we come to, to celebrate, celebrate our God, God who loved and loves us, us so much. much. <laughs> our first hymn this morning is A Mighty Fortress is Our God, versus one and four. It's in the Pilgrim Hemnal 363.
prayer of confession. O God of comfort and God of challenge, we come to you this morning the way the, way the Israelites did, full of complaints and dissatisfaction. Nothing is enough. We do, we do not recognize your blessing at work in our day-to-day -day -day lives. Forgive us. In our complaints, challenge us, as you did the Israelites, to consider the bigger picture of oppression, injustice, and inequality around us. Forgive us when we close our eyes for fear of what you might show us. Lift up loving and compassionate leaders to open our eyes until we see what you see in our world. Amen. Our complaints are really just a way we show how separated we are from God. But please know that nothing separates you from God's love. God loves you unconditionally, today and every day. Amen. Patrick was a real person 
And he lived a long time ago in the fifth century. And legend has it that he was uh, British under sort of a Roman rule uh, in that sort of community. And he was kidnapped and brought to Ireland where he was enslaved for six years. He escaped, went back to Britain, and eventually he returned to Ireland where he brought Christianity. And he is known as the saint who introduced and evangelized and brought Ireland into the fold, as it were. Now there are a lot of legends about St. Patrick. Uh, the most famous is that he drove the snakes out of Ireland. Now, did you know that there are no snakes in Ireland? Well, there aren't. And legend has it that St. Patrick was fasting and praying on a hill for 40 days, like someone else we know. And so he was fasting and praying and these snakes attacked him. So he drove them into the sea. And that's why there aren't any snakes in Ireland. Well, of course, we know that that's legend. He's also associated with this thing, and this is my very poor rendition of a shamrock, which is a kind of plant, and it has three leaves on a stem. And St. Patrick would use the shamrock when he was teaching people about Christianity to describe what we call the Trinity, or the three-in-one nature of God. So one leaf is the Creator. Another leaf, the Christ. And the third leaf, the Holy Spirit. And this really took hold. And that's why we associate him with the shamrock. So think of that when you're having your shamrock shake on Wednesday. Please join me for a little prayer. Holy Creator, we ask for your blessing. We ask to be shown the way by the Christ and to be inspired by the Holy Spirit. Please guide us as we live our daily lives and remind us of your way on St. Patrick's Day and every day. Amen. This morning's readings from the Hebrew Scriptures are reading from Numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go to the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke out against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt just to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent, and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze, and put it on a pole. And whenever the serpent bit someone, that person would look at the bronze serpent and live. This morning's Gospel reading is from John, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that God gave his only child, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, 
but in order that the world may be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. So ends this morning's readings. May God add a blessing of understanding to these words. This morning's uh, gospel message contains one of the most popular Bible verses in contemporary American evangelical communities, John 3.16. God so loved the world that God gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Its popularity has resulted in pulling it out of the context of the larger story. Indeed, all of this morning's gospel passage is difficult to discuss without taking the scene immediately before it into consideration. Our gospel reading is a discourse by Jesus to a man named Nicodemus. It follows a conversation Jesus has had with him. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, that is, a Jewish religious leader and teacher, part of the Jewish establishment in the temple. Nicodemus sought Jesus out under the cover of night to ask him some questions. You see, after Jesus cleansed the temple, which we talked about last week, he continued teaching and performing signs and baptizing people. So Nicodemus, having seen the signs, was convinced that Jesus had come from God because he had seen the signs. Jesus, however, doesn't think too highly of people who believe solely based on signs. He wants people to believe out of a faith which creates a change in the person. So Jesus tells Nicodemus, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can this be, to be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb to be born? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh. What is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished when I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Poor Nicodemus doesn't understand, and we really can't blame him. I frequently think that if there were a time where I met Jesus, the first thing that would come out of his mouth is, Very truly, I tell you, Jessica, you're not getting it. So Nicodemus is struggling to understand Jesus, and Jesus is trying to set him straight. Jesus goes on to, to use an illustration that a Pharisee would understand, a passage that references the Hebrew Scriptures. Jesus begins, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Here, Jesus is referencing the book of Numbers, sometimes referred to as in the wilderness. The book of Numbers recounts the journey of the Israelite people from God's revelation on Sinai to God's final instructions to Moses at Moab. The passage Jesus references was our Hebrew scriptures reading this morning. 
As you heard in the reading, the Israelites were not happy. Why have you brought us out of Egypt just to have us starve and die in the wilderness? No food, no water, and the food we have is terrible. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? In the midst of all of God's gifts, we humans love to complain. And God answers their complaints with something they can really complain about. And I think of my mother in this passage, who when I would complain to her would look at me and say, you better watch it or I'll give you something to complain about. So God sends along venomous snakes and they kill many people. And of course the people become contrite and ask for forgiveness. God tells Moses to set a serpent upon a, a pole. And when the people are bitten by one of the venomous snakes, all they have to do is look at the bronze statue snake and live. The serpent Moses raises in numbers reminds the Israelites of God's love. A love that doesn't always come in the form of comfort or in the magical granting of wishes and desires. We have to remember that our very life comes from God. The presence of the serpent forces the people to acknowledge their wrongdoing. In the Gospel, Jesus is drawing a correlation between the bronze serpent and himself. Just as the bronze serpent corrected the Israelites' perspective and brought them closer to God, Jesus is our help. Believing in Jesus' message and following that path brings us closer to God. The bronze serpent was set up publicly, it was for everyone. But the people had to choose to look at it if they wanted to be healed. The choice was theirs. But it was not set aside for a few. It was public. Just as what God offers us through Jesus is for everyone, we just need to make the choice. Do we follow Jesus' way? Do we listen and believe in Jesus' message or not? Nicodemus was understandably confused by Jesus. His conversation with Jesus, he seemed to think that Jesus meant by born again to be physically born again. Jesus loves to use new, loves to use words in new ways. And it makes us grapple with those words the way Nicodemus does. Life, born again, light, darkness. They are words we think we know. But Jesus asks us to shift our understanding. Jesus asked Nicodemus to let go of his preconceived notion of birth, to become born again, born from above into a new life. Nicodemus had to let go of the reality of what he thought he knew about birth and life. We're all born, all of us, every creature, every living piece of creation. It's how we enter into this life. And it only happens once. To be born again, to Nicodemus, creates a conundrum. As modern Christians, we are very familiar with the term born again. But like Nicodemus, our understanding is stunted. For many contemporary Christians, to be born again denotes a private, personal relationship with Jesus. We are changed in our hearts in a private conversion. In the modern Christian context, the meaning of the Greek word translated as again, or from above, according to Gail O'Day, has been flattened to have only one meaning which is now roughly equivalent to an individual's private conversion. Nicodemus also flattened the meaning of the word. A literal return to the womb is how he understood it. Our fixed understanding of born again mirrors Nicodemus's misunderstanding. Nowadays, the term born again has a lot of baggage, and we form harsh, ju harsh judgments about it. For someone to be born again, uh, for some, to be born again 
is how you get into heaven, and it's the only way to get there. For others to be evangelized by someone who calls themselves born again has led to being hurt and rejected, and for still others, our modern understanding of born again has helped guide them to the door out of the church where they have not returned. Casual use of terms leads to a domestication and misunderstanding of the fact, well, a misunderstanding of the fact that we think we understand. There's also been a domestication of John 3.16 which, to remind you, is begins, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. For many of us, there's an association of a kind of magical thinking, that Jesus will magically fix the world for us. And we take a kind of passive role in this world. Jesus will judge and save. I just need to take care of my own self, my own beliefs. I can say that I believe in Jesus, and I don't have to take action in the world for justice or against hate. That's jobs, that job is for God, right? It's for Jesus. In the last 40 or so years, John 3.16 has become more and more strongly related to American evangelism. Billy Graham popularized it, and it's become the Bible verse for our soundbite culture. A verse broken away from its parent's story and its parent gospel. You'll see it at signs at football games. In the 70s and 80s, there is a guy who would don a, a rainbow afro wig and get in front of the cameras at major sporting events with a sign that said 316. You see John 316 on inspirational home decor. And when I moved into my office here at First Congregational, it was even written on a, white, on a whiteboard that was up on one of the bookshelves. And it is an inspiring passage. God so loved the world, the world, all of it, that God gave its only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. I think we need to look at what is meant by belief. Is it pointing to a private experience? In a way it does. It is personal what we believe, but what do we believe? Is it that a magical Jesus will fix what's wrong? That people will be blessed who believe? that will help them in business, or help them win football games, or guide them to heaven? Or is it to believe in Jesus' message, to agree with his teaching? We need to take a look at John 3.16 in relation to its parent gospel, the gospel according to John. We can't divorce it from the rest of John, especially the following verses, which include, people love the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. Those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. John is telling us that our actions are important. According to scholar Samuel Cruz, for John, believing in Jesus has more to do with what people believe regarding evil, hate, exploitation, and injustice rather than an esoteric religious conversion. God so loved the world that God sent Jesus. And Jesus came with a message. He shows us a path. And it's a path that we're to follow. And following that path demands our action in the world. There is nothing passive about it. Cruz writes, it seems that John was letting us know that whether or not to believe in Jesus cannot be a neutral decision. Jesus demands a stance, which requires active decision-making. Neutrality and indecisiveness are not an option. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night, unsure. 
He was a leader with a lot to lose. He at once believes, but doesn't really believe. And that's so much like all of us. And as he did with Nicodemus, Jesus forces us to question our most basic understandings, to take steps that may seem out of sync with everyone else. He creates a dissonance that helps shift us. He creates a dissonance that helps shift us into a new understanding, a new life, living into the love of God in this world. Amen. Our second hymn this morning is also from the Pilgrim Hymnal, number 320, Immortal Love Forever Full, verses 1, 3, and 6.
However, we still send our prayers to all the frontline workers and all the healthcare workers dealing with the COVID crisis. We send our love and prayers to Edith and Flossie and all of our folks who are living safe but isolated lives during this COVID time. This morning, I'm asking you all to join me in a prayer for a very special, very sick young girl. Her name is Maya. We've been helping her mother. Can you grant healing prayers, O oh Lord, and return this girl to her family soon? We also pray for people living today with the repercussions of racism and colonialism. We pray for people in war-torn lands. We pray for people living in oppression and under military occupation. May you grant us peace and understanding, O Lord. In your holy name we pray. Now if you would join me for the prayer Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.